Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. I think as humans, we, we're, really, we're really good at is uh, we have excuses. You know what I'm talking about? We have excuses for everything. We like to make excuses. We like to make excuses as to for our mistakes. We like to make excuses as to why we don't get enough exercise. We like to make excuses as to why we're not eating the way that we wish we would. We like to make excuses as to all these things. We love excuses, right? Something that we're very, very good at. And we also, not just in those ways, but I think in our lives, we have excuses as why we don't obey when God calls us to obey. When God asks us to do something, to live a certain way, when God calls us to go talk to somebody, whatever it might be, we always are very good at getting some excuses on why we're not giving or why we're not serving or why we're not sharing the gospel. And maybe you've heard some of these or you recognize some of these excuses. Number one is I don't have time, right? How many of you know we're busy as humans right now? We're busy people. We got, we're on the go. We're going from one thing to another. I'm too busy to do what God's called me to do. My schedule is too full. Or even there's the thought of the fear of like, what if I go to share Jesus and then all of a sudden I don't even know what to say. Like the words weren't coming out of my mouth. There's this fear that can come and we often use that as an excuse. Or maybe I don't have the money to do that or the resources or I'm too old or I'm too young. We all have these excuses, I'm tired, or I'm weak, or I'm broken, or my past disqualifies me from the things God has called me to do. And do you know who didn't really have excuses for his behavior was Samson. Now what I mean is that this is the man with all the strength in the world, the man who made this commitment and whose strength was a direct gift from God, a man who had all he needed, he had the power, he had the strength but yet he didn't actually live up to what he was supposed to do. He had everything he needed. It wasn't a lack of strength why he fell. It was his own internal thinking and the way his attitudes were. And if you remember in the book of Judges, we see this cycle that Israel goes through, right? Israel does good. Israel does bad. Israel gets punished. Israel asks for help. God sends them a judge and Israel is saved. You see this over and over and over through that book of Judges. And if you haven't read it, there is some absolutely remarkable, crazy, wild stories in there. I think Judges is filled with like pretty much every one of them could be their own like epic movie. Like for real. Like they're absolutely remarkable. Over and over again, they have all these moments happen. And what we see throughout the book is we see a steady decline in Israel's relationship with God. Really, the steady decline. And, he, and their hero, or their judge after judge, kind of even they start to have this kind of slow decline when it comes to their obedience. And so there's another man mentioned in Judges that had real reasons why he couldn't go, why he couldn't do what God had called him to do, yet he went anyway. And this is a man named Ehud. Now, you might be here today and be like, I don't even know if I know who that is. Well, this story, we're going to go through it. it. It is absolutely crazy what happens in this story. It's almost like straight out of a movie. It's like Shawshank Redemption meets Gladiator in this movie. Like, it's, it's unbelievable. Like, and and you, you laugh, but if you know the story, like, it's for real. And so we're going to go through this together. It's this epic story of an unlikely hero conquering an enemy. And it might, again, it's probably one of the most unique stories in, the, in all of Scripture, to be honest. This story is absolutely crazy. And the detail, listen to the detail of this story. This is Judges chapter 3, verse 12 uh, to, I think this is, we're going to uh, 12 to 13 right here. And it says this, once again, right? Remember, that's how it starts. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. And the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. And Eglon enlisted the Ammonites and the Amalekites as allies, and then he went out and defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho and the city, uh, Jericho, the city of Palms. Now, what we're seeing here is obviously the kind of the, the start of this story, explaining the context 
of what's been going on. But what it's also showing us is the consequence of disobedience when we, when we know what we're supposed to do, but we're not actually following it. It says, once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. I sometimes read this in like, once again, Dustin did evil in the Lord's sight. Sometimes that's how I feel. Maybe you feel the same way. Once again, I did it again. I'm going back to the ways I know I shouldn't be, but I, I did it again. And so what happens is we see it's so clear in Judges, the consequence that happens when, when, when they stop obeying. When we stop obeying, we saw this in Samson's life as well. When he stopped obeying, when he stopped doing the things that he was called to do, when he started doing, stopped doing those things, that's when it says that the, he, he didn't realize that the Lord's strength had already left him. The consequence of evil. They did evil and they stopped obeying. And what happened is that God took his hand of blessing off of them and they were left to fend for themselves. And we all know Israel and I think we all know ourselves well enough to know that when we're left to fend for ourselves, oftentimes things go downhill very quickly. When we're left on our own, do the things, things can go downhill extremely, extremely quickly. And if we continue on in the story, chapter uh, verse 14 says this, and the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. 18 years. But when the, the, the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. And his name was Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed man of the tribe of, tribe of Benjamin. And the Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. Of Moab. So this is this moment where we are introduced to this, this hero, Ehud. And what we, all we really know about him is that he's left-handed. And if you kind of study through this, what this, in, in the original language, more so would have meant is that, is that it wasn't that he was just left-handed, but it would in fact more have been the fact that he actually couldn't use his right arm in his right hand. That most likely he was disabled in his arm and he couldn't move it or he was limited in how he could move it. So really he was left-handed more so out of necessity rather than that's the way he was born. It was more like I, my right arm doesn't work. I need to use my left hand. If you study through this, it's kind of like that. Like he had like zero control or ability to use his right hand and his right arm. And then, so this is a man, Ehud, what did he have? He had an excuse on why he didn't have to go. He had an excuse as to why he shouldn't and couldn't go. He didn't have the strength of Samson. He didn't have the luscious locks like Samson. He didn't have what Samson had. He had the excuse, yeah, my arm doesn't work. God, send somebody else. I think so many times in our life, we, that's our attitude. Is it's like, I got the excuse. God's like, I want you to go be a light in, at work. Or I want you to go share Jesus with your neighbor. And we're like, yeah, but, but I can't. I don't think I'm capable of doing that. I don't know the Bible well enough. I'm not living the life I think I should be living. I, I don't think I should be the one. God, send somebody else. We've always felt that way, I think. We've all had moments where we feel so insignificant. We feel like we don't have anything to offer. We say, I'm too weak. My mistakes are too great. My fear is too powerful. I don't have the right education. I don't have the right friends. I, I'm not married. I don't have kids. I don't have the influence. And this is how we feel oftentimes, that God send somebody else. I, I'm not capable of doing this. I, I think we've all had moments where that's how we feel. That we feel that what's in front of us, the challenge, the obstacle, the giant in front of us is too big and we're too weak. But what's fascinating about Ehud is he had this incredible confidence about him. So it says in the next verse, so we had made a double-edged dagger that was about a foot long, and he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. And again, there's so much detail in this story. Again, it's a very short story, but it's filled with detail. Why are they telling you where he strapped his sword? Like, wh why are they telling you he's left-handed? Like, why are they sharing this information? It's because this is very important information to the outcome of the story. See, what would happen back in the day is that people, when, when they were right-handed, they'd have their sword on their right leg so they could pull it out and fight. It's kind of awkward, you know, to do this, right? And so what he does is he has it on his, uh, on, his, on his right side so he can pull it out with his left hand. So when he's about to go through the security, when he's about to get checked by the guards, they're going to check and like, oh, no, he's, he's clean. No, nothing going on with this guy. 
It was abnormal this, for him to do this. It was abnormal for him to have his weapon on his, on his right side and not on his left side. And so, so his disability or the fact that he was left-handed, I think, for, was so abnormal for the time, but it was so important and integral to the, uh, to the deliverance of this nation. Because everyone in the day would have been the opposite, right-handed. So when the guards, again, they would have went to check him, they, they would have said, yeah, he's good, we're clean. But what happened is that his disability or his weakness, it actually became his strength. It actually allowed him through into the palace. It allowed him into the moment that we're going to read about shortly. See, I think our story of weakness has this ability to become a beacon of hope for those who hear it. That even in our weakest moments, in our weakness, as the Bible says, he is made strong. And when we're made strong in our weakness, that's a powerful story. The fact that, yes, we've had things in our past, but rather than let those define our future, let's use those as fuel to build a future and help people who are struggling with the same things that we're going through as well. You're never too far gone for God to use you. And I think sometimes we feel like we're too weak, and in fact, it's our weakness that's actually going to get us the victory. We have to understand that God created us in a certain way. And yes, we've done things and we've gone through hard moments, but... You, he will still use you. So the question is, what is your weakness? And how can God turn it into a pillar of strength for somebody else? You know, I think sometimes when we're going through life, again, we have hard, hard, hard moments. But when we can get around people who have gone through similar things, there's so much strength that comes. There's so much strength that comes when we can get around people who are also struggling. We can build, build strength together. What is your weakness and how can will God turn it into a pillar of strength? Now verse 17 says this, he, he brought the tribute money to Eglon who was very fat. That's what it says. Now imagine being known as the Bible's fat guy. Like, that's what he's known for. Like, we don't know much about him. All we know is it says this clearly. He brings him the tribute money, and he's very fat. That's what it says. It says, after delivering the payment, he had started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. That's what he's known for, this guy. It's a tough position to be in. Samson's known for his muscles and his strength, and this king is known for how big his belly is. It's a tough position for him to be. But I think it's so key. They're showing all this detail. I think it's so key because I think it's showing the weakness of Israel, but the strength of their captors. See, what had happened for 18 years, this guy had been taking the tributes, taking the food, taking the money. He had built his fame. He had built his strength based off of somebody else. So when you see him, he's this big guy. And who comes in? This, e this Ehud guy with, with, with a barely working right arm. It kind of shows the picture of Israel. They're so weak in front of a, a massive enemy. It's really, that's how I see it. It shows th this state. And it says that they had people help carry the tribute. Because this is before the days of e-transfers and money orders. This is a day where like if you're going to bring gold, you got to like bring gold. Like and got to carry it. So he has this, this group of people who are coming to carry it. The taxes were so high, and the Israelites were struggling, and it was, it was a hard time. That's why they cried out, God, save us from what we're going through. Verse 19, but when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gilgal, he turned back. He came to Eglon and said, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet. And he sent them all out of the room. Now, I don't know, like, Ehud, why he left and came back, right? We don't get the detail. Though. Why did he leave and then come back? You know, maybe he was scared of the assignment. Maybe. Maybe he had been overthinking it in his head as we do. I can't do this. What if I get caught? What if, what if I get killed? Why did God choose little old me? There's got to be somebody in the land stronger. There's got to be someone in the land more capable. There's got to be someone better in my family to go than me. Why did I even come? Send the man who can't even use his right hand. But this is what I think, and, and this is just my thinking, is what I think is he went and he's walking, and then he sees, sees the idols. And what, he, what happens, I think he remembers the 18 years of pain and misery. I think he remembers what it was like before and goes, Not, 
there's got to be something better. Like, I'm called to do this. I'm going to do it. He remembers that God often uses unlikely weak people to do mighty things. So I think he walks. He sees the idols and says, this has got to change. So he turns back around again. That's just my opinion. right? That's just my thinking. I, I could be way off. But then it goes into this. Ehud went over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in a cool upstairs room. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. As King Eglon rose from his seat, Ehud rushed with his left hand and pulled out the dagger strapped to his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. The dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. So Ehud did not pull out the dagger, and the king's bowels emptied. Then Ehud closed and locked the doors of the room and escaped down the, la the latrine. After Ehud was gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors of the upstairs room locked. They thought he might be using the latrine in the room, so they waited. But when the king didn't come out after a long day, they became concerned and got a key. And when they opened the doors, they found that their master was dead on the floor. Now that is a wild story. Like when I say it's like Shawshank Redemption, like the guy's escaping through the, the latrine. Like, this, this story is absolutely incredible and honestly probably one of the worst plans you could have to take out a king. Like, for real. Send the guy who, who, who can't even use his right arm to go to the king and then he's going to escape through the bathroom and the sword's going to disappear. Imagine trying to tell Israel this is, the, this is God's plan for, for, for the victory. They're going to be like, no chance, man. This isn't going to work. It's a wild, wild story. You want me to stab him, and then he's going to relieve himself. Then you want me to escape through the bathroom. Seems like a crazy, crazy plan to me. But I think oftentimes the craziest plans, the things that we can't even imagine in our own minds, are the exact ways that things are going to work out because that's how God sees it, and God sees things way differently and way better than we do. He sees things so much different. It's so crazy, this plan, that it might actually work. A plan that only works with a man like Ehud. A plan that it can only come from the wisdom and connection to God. A plan that requires someone willing to do whatever it takes to see the victory. Someone devoted to God despite the pain and despite the weakness saying, I'm still going to serve and I'm still going to go. He didn't let his weakness define him. He used it to serve. Someone who was willing to put their calling above their excuse. Someone who was willing to go. Verse 26, while the servants were waiting, Ehud escaped passing the stone idols on his way. When he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Ehud sounded a call to arms. Then he led a band of Israelites down from the hills. This is so powerful, this, this, this part right here, verse 28. Follow me, he said, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab and your enemy. This part right here, forward, so they followed him. And the Israelites took control of the shadow crossings of the Jordan River across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. They attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of the strongest and most able-bodied warriors. None of them escaped. The end of this epic story is he goes back and he shares the, shares the news. Hey, the king's gone. Yeah, God sent me and maybe we were a little confused about it, but it worked. And he's gone. Follow me. But then he says, this is so powerful, he says, um, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab. Not the Lord will, not the Lord will give, will give us victory. He says the Lord has given us victory. This confidence that comes of saying, if God did it through him, he can use us. And they go and they conquer their enemy. They actually go and they conquer their enemy. And I think for some of us, we think our enemy is so powerful, but we got to take the first step to actually go and make a difference. I think some of us, our fear is so crippling. It's, it cripples us to the core. I mean, we feel like we can't even move. We can't even go forward. We feel like we can't even go into the places. And we, can't, we feel like our calling is so far away and we're so far gone and we're just stuck. We're so stuck in our fear. I think for a lot of these men, for 18 years, they've probably been imagining this moment. How was God going to deliver us? 
how, how is it going to happen? I'm sure they'd heard the stories of deliverance in the past. And it's like, God, what about us? They're waiting. They're imagining this moment, waiting for a leader to follow, waiting for a man or waiting for a woman to stand up and say, let's go. I think for a lot of us in our families, our families are waiting for us to stand up and start fighting. People are waiting, and some of us, are, we've been waiting for years and years. We're waiting for somebody else to stand up to, so we can follow them. I think God, you know, it's time for you to stand up, and you're going to be the leader. You're going to be the leader of your family. You're going to be the leader wherever you go at work. You might be like, yeah, but I'm not qualified. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have the education. What it matters is if you're willing. Are you willing to stand up above the noise, above the fear, above it all, and actually go forward into the places he's called you to go? Because I believe there's so much more for us. There's more for us as a church, and I think there's more for us as families. I think there's more for us. But we have to be obedient. See, the story starts again, Ehud, and it says, once again, once again. I think sometimes that's the way it's been in our families. Once again, we gotta push and we gotta fight and we gotta fight for our families. We gotta fight for our city. We gotta fight for our kids. We gotta fight for our spouses and be willing to stand up and be the leaders that God has called us to be. Even if we don't know what the outcome is gonna look like. You know, I don't think Ehud would have been their first choice. I don't think he would have been their second choice. I don't think he would have been their 10,000th 10, 10, choice. It's a hard word. <laughs> but he was God's choice. You know, in your life, you might be walking around and people might not want to pick you first. If you remember back in elementary school, you'd pick teams. Some of us were the last one picked, and we hate that. And you're like, what about me? You're God's choice. I think God's calling you right now. I think he's calling you to be, make an impact, to make a difference. To speak life into somebody. To not just walk past people, but to actually speak life and smile and shake someone's hand, give someone a hug, to buy someone a meal, love people properly. You're God's choice to do that. And the last verse of the story says this, verse 30. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years. 80 years. Now, like, that's not actually that long of a time, you know, because there's going to be next. If you read through it, it's going to be like, once again, you know. I'm going to invite Prince off to play some uh, keyboards here. 80 years. It's a powerful story. Who does God call to, to do it? Who does God call? Not the perfect people, that's for sure. Because if that was the case, there'd be no leaders. Because none of us are perfect. We're all broken and weak. We all have something. And obviously our goal and our mission is to become the greatest people that we can be not for out for the outward but for the inward of great people because that's who we're trying to become more like Jesus who does God choose he chooses the willing and often he chooses the unlikely when I look at my life and how you know I've been in full-time ministry now for almost 10 years which is unbelievable to me 10 years T to be honest most of my life no one would have imagined that it would be me, you know, speaking publicly or being a pastor. No one. Why? Because I was shy. I was always getting into trouble. When I was a teenager, I started wanting to date Beth. And I had to convince her parents that I wasn't bad. Because a lot of the stories they were hearing weren't great stories. I wasn't the greatest guy. I had a, a lot of struggles and a lot of problems and no one would have imagined that it'd be me. I never would have imagined. People always say, so why'd you become a pastor? I'm like, I don't know. 
kind of just like happened. Like, like God just kind of laid it down. When I was a kid, I never was like, I want to be a pastor. Never in my life did I ever say that. I was planning on going into power engineering. I don't know why. My friends were doing it probably. <laughs> it's like cool in my school to go into power engineering. So I even upgraded my math. I did, I did, uh, I did applied math, which is like the lower math, grade 12, first semester. Then I did the pure math, second semester, and I got like 58%. I never would have made it into power engineering, right? Like, I tried. I never thought it would be me here, but yet God chose me. And I think that all I can say is, thank you. That when God calls us to do something, and it might not be being a pastor, it might just be God's calling you to be a good mother, to be a mom. God might be calling you to be a good husband. I think some of us, some of us men, we put so much energy and effort into work and into our careers that we actually sometimes leave our families behind when our greatest calling, I think, as men is to be husbands and to be fathers. But we care more about work than we care about what's going on at home. God's looking for those who are willing to put their weakness in the line of fire and allow God to turn it into a strength. To put your weakness on the line. This is what Paul said. This is so powerful. And it's almost like he's roasting the church here. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, I laugh when I read this. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that a few of, that few of you are wise in the world's eyes and powerful or wealthy when God called you. What an encouragement, right? Few of you are wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world Things counted as nothing at all and used them to bring, not, bring to nothing what the world considers important. Now, I want to pause there because what's, what's happened is, and we see this so clearly when, when, when Jesus went to the cross, right? What is the cross known for? To be honest, it's known for punishment, death, humiliation. It's, it's known for like brutally harming humans and killing people. That's what it's known for. But yet now the cross, which is this thing that's so awful, really, now is a beacon of hope in our world. I don't know how many people have cross tattoos or cross necklaces and they're going around. That's a beacon of hope. See, God will take things that are broken, things that are, that are meant to harm, things that are painful, and he's going to turn those into beacons of hope for other people. He, he often chooses us who are unlikely to do powerful and mighty things. In verse 29, as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus for your benefit. God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. He gets all the glory. When we get the victory, He's the one who gets the praise. It's about Him. And again, I want to go back to the statement. Ehud said, the Lord has given you the victory. He didn't say, now Ehud will give you the victory today. He said, the Lord has given you the victory. He realized the battle was already won. All that took was someone be obedient, someone willing. Someone in who's weak, who is probably an outcast, to go be the hero. And I often wonder, when I read through the scriptures, this is how my brain works, I often wonder, what would have happened if Ehud said no? No, thank you. That's too tough. It's too hard. I think would, would Israel have been in captivity another 18 years? I don't think so. I think God would have found somebody else. I think God would have been like, okay, Ehud, 
I'll find somebody else. If I don't say yes, someone else will. If I don't obey, somebody else will obey. God would have found somebody else, I think. Someone willing, someone available, someone willing to put their weakness on the line for freedom and deliverance. I think so. I want to encourage all of us today. Let's say yes. Here I am, send me. Most dangerous prayer we can pray. Here I am, send me. And if we want to be sent, there's a few things. We have to be available. We have to be willing. Are you available? Does your schedule permit you to be available? Are you willing? Does your attitude allow you to be available? I don't encourage you. Maybe those of us who are waiting, we're like, God, like, like send me. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. And the best thing that we can do while we wait is build our character. The best thing we can do while we're waiting for God to move is to build your character. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I could dedicate the next 100 years of my life to those things and still not make it. If you got time, dedicate yourself to growing your character. You know, our takeaway today is this, is that is, is, uh, don't let your excuses pave the way for someone else. Let it be your story. Don't let your excuses pave the way for someone else, but let it be your story that paves the way. That we're leading people down the path, not walking away from the path and letting other people pave it for us. I want to encourage you that, that God is choosing you. I don't know what's in front of you. The things God has called you to do in the next year, the next five years, 10 years, but he's choosing you to do it. So let's learn to be obedient. Follow and allow him to move and he'll be the one to get the glory. So God, we thank you for today. We thank you that we have people like Ehud in scripture who are an encouragement to us. Those of us who feel so weak, God, I thank you that you're still using us and you're still choosing us. God, help us be obedient and have the strength and courage to go forward even when what lies in front of us seems painful or hard. Help us stand together and fight together and love each other well and carry each other's burdens and forgive one another. And encourage one another. Be generous with one another. God, help us be a light in this dark world, in this dark city. And God, I thank you that in my weakness, in our weakness, you are made strong. Help us not be ashamed of our weakness. But God, I thank you that you're going to bring strength to it. In Jesus' name.